practicing more. All right, good morning. Today we're going to read from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 17. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all of this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Even, even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the suffering of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, Live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you and praise you that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us, that you don't want to be far from us, that all that we need to do, as Barry said, look at creation and see that it shouts out the glory of your name and sings your praises. Father, you have created us just a little lower than the angels and that you're mindful of us. You've created us in your image to know right from wrong, and Lord, we have chosen to disobey and rebel against you. But instead of pouring out your wrath upon us, you chose to pour it out on your Son. And Lord, we are here today praising and glorifying your name because we are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you that faith comes from sal salvation comes from faith and believing in Jesus Christ and the work that he came to do. So Lord, as we read the words of Jesus' teachings in Luke, help us to apply them to our lives, to long for the time that when he returns and to live out our lives, as the scripture said from Peter, as foreigners and aliens in this world in reverent fear, longing for the day that we meet Jesus face to face. Open our ears to hear what the Spirit says to us, Lord, and we just thank you for the freedom that we have to come and worship you. Lord, we pray that your sovereignty continues over this country and this world until Jesus Christ returns as King. We pray this in his name. Amen. So I've got to ask you a question, and you've got to put your hands up for this one. No trying to mess with you or nothing. I just want to know, how many of you think Jesus Christ will come in the lifetime of your grandchildren? Okay. You think it's going to be longer than that? Keep your hands up. Don't put them down. Just exercise here. If you, don't, if you do think that, do you think he'll come in the lifetime of your children? Keep your hands up. That means that he's going to come before then. We're working our way backwards, okay? Okay? Do you think he'll come in your lifetime even? Wow. Do you think he'll come today? He might. Do you think he will, though? 
Because Scripture tells us to think that He will. And Scripture tells us that it will come the most unlikely time. And as you put your hands down, that meant the probabilities went up that Jesus was coming today. I mean, that's just a probability. But are you living your lives out as foreigners, doing what Jesus has told you to do? Because as we've gone through the Gospel of Luke, Luke is writing this orderly account so that we know what we believe. And Luke has gotten into this teachings here of Jesus that we started in chapter 11 here. And we'll have more parables coming up than you see in any other Gospel and everything. These further teaching illustrations that you'll either hear and understand and obey or your heart, your heart will actually become hardened because you'll be hearing and not responding to God's Word. Today is the day of your salvation. Respond to the words that the Holy Spirit is crying out to you. And Jesus tells us specifically to live each day as though He were returning. That is how the first disciples lived. They lived in expectancy that Jesus would be coming back then. In fact, John had to say in his gospel that, it, that the rumor that was being spread was that Jesus was going to come back for sure before John died. And John just said, no, what is it? Because Peter asked that question. What is it to you, Peter, if John does live until I return? You're supposed to live as though Jesus were returning. Living as Christ in this world. Doing good. Proclaiming the gospel message. Serving your kings, as we're going to re- serving your king, as we read in this scripture that you should be like a servant who is dressed ready with the lamps burning. Do you have that picture, Kim? Yes. So if you can see this picture, you can see the guy at first. He's got his robe on, and then he kind of hikes it up and he ties it around and gets it all ready to go to battle. First Peter three talked about girding up your loins, even though the NIV, and that's why I chose that, didn't say it. The phrase, gird up your loins, appears in Ephesians 6, 4, when it says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Um, it's mentioned in 2 Kings 1, 18, when Elijah uh, girded up himself and outran Ahab. Remember that? It's mentioned in 1 Peter 1, 13, where it says, To make your minds ready, the NIV says, and the... the Scripture, uh, the King James in the original text says, Wherefore gird up the loins of your minds, that you need to think differently, because you're not thinking in the way of the things of the world. And Jesus has already said about those things, Don't, why do you worry about the things the world worries about? Why do you long for the things that the world longs for? You are not of this world. You are a foreigner and an alien, and though you suffer or anything else that happens, prepare your mind to serve diligently until your king returns. And these were words that were said by Jesus before He ever left, so they didn't have the comprehension of what His return would be like. You and I do. We know that Jesus ascended. And when He ascended, the, the disciples still asked Him, said, Are you at this time going to establish the kingdom of Israel? I'm in Acts chapter 1, that, that book that uh, Luke wrote after uh, his Gospel of Luke, telling us how to live like the church by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he said, don't worry about those times or seasons. It's not for you to know. But instead, you will be my witnesses when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So has the Holy Spirit come upon you? And are you living today as if this were the day that Jesus were returning? If you live your life in any way other than that, you're living your life contrary to the gospel. Because if you're putting off and saying Jesus won't come, He's been delaying... You're living differently than what Jesus commanded you to live. Think about that. It wasn't a trick question. Walt, you didn't win the prize for holding your hand up longer or anything. The point is, is are you living as though you were serving your king with your lamps burning, dressed ready for service until the king returns? So like I said, this part's passage of Scripture, well, let me go ahead a little bit first. In Luke 21, Jesus says this, verse 34, But watch yourself, or your hearts will be weighed down by dissipation, drunkenness, and the worries of life. And that day will spring upon you suddenly like a snare, like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. So keep watch at all times and pray that you may have the strength to escape all that is about to happen and to stand before the Son of Man. Now that's Luke chapter 21. We're in Luke chapter 12 now, so let's go back and we'll review a little bit even in chapter 11. 
Chapter 11 started out with Jesus teaching his disciples to pray. This is where this segment started. And then Jesus casts out a demon, and the people are amazed. But they, the crowd say, and we're, we're, this is hopefully that the crowds will come to Jesus and that the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees and the experts in the law will come to Jesus, but it's also training for his disciples. The crowd say, hey, we need another sign from you, another miracle. We see all this, but it's not enough for us to become your disciples. And the Pharisees and the experts and the religious leaders say, the power that you're using comes from the devil, not from God Almighty. What kind of lunacy, what kind of darkness that is truly there when you try to extinguish the light? Who puts a candle out, lights it, does he not put it out for the whole room to see? That is Jesus that it tells us in Luke chapter 11. All these things that have been done have been done so that the world will see. And Luke 11 chapter 23 says, He who is not with me is against me, and who does not gather with me scatters. Jesus goes on to tell, if you've cleaned out the room, you better be very careful that you've cleaned it out thoroughly and replaced it with the light of Christ because if you don't, the outcome is going to be worse for that because the de demons are going to come back with more for force and the, the outcome is going to be worse than the first. Verse 26 says, The final plight of that man is worse than the first. Then a woman says, Blessed are you, Jesus, or blessed is the woman who gave you birth, Jesus. And he says, Instead, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Do you see the pattern here? Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Then he goes on to give woes to the Pharisees because they clean the outside of the cup but not the inside. They are like tombs where people walk upon them and have made themselves unclean. And then the experts and the scribes. Uh, get offended and say, are you talking to us too? And he says, yes, I am for sure. You know, we get this image, the world says Jesus is just so meek and mild, and Scripture does tell us ab about having those attributes. But Jesus was not a pushover. He told them plainly, inside the house where he came to dinner at the Pharisee, you guys are wicked. And he said this in verse 52, Woe to you experts in the law, for you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have entered those who are entering. Entering what? Entering into the kingdom of heaven. You are either in the kingdom of heaven or you're not. And if you are, Scripture tells us that you're already seated in the heavenly realms. You just have not seen it physically come to being yet. But that will come to being when your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ returns. Are you serving Him? In the meantime, a large crowd, I'm in chapter 12 now, in the meantime, a large crowd develops and Jesus warns them and warns His disciples against the leaven of the Pharisees so that it doesn't spread throughout. And that is hypocrisy, claiming to be one thing but not being, playing out a role, being an actor. And He says to fear God, not fear man, because God has the authority and the power to throw you into hell after you die. After you die, you will face judgment. You will either go to heaven or hell. You will either be put with the sheep or you'll be labeled with the goats and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You better confess Christ in this world so that He will confess you and not blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Whatever that means, we'll leave that for another day. But if you're not listening to the Holy Spirit, are you really His child? Could you be blaspheming against Him? The Holy Spirit, Jesus says in verse 12, will teach you what you should say. Do you know what the fruits of the Spirit are? Are you putting them to practice? Guard yourself against every form of greed because life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Tell that to someone in this country today who says they believe in God. They know who Jesus is. Then he tells this parable of a rich man that says, What will I do with all that God has given me? Let me put that in there. That God has given me from the breath of life to the abundance I have, to my health, to my children, to everything else, all of the mercies and grace that God gives out every single day. What will I do? I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll do more for myself. And God said, you fool, your life will be required of you tonight. The one who has the authority to throw in you into hell or you to usher you into the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus even says in verse 20, who will have what you accumulated that you worked so hard for? Who will have that? And what will it do to them? Will it just get them seeking after the things of this world? 
Verse 21, this is how it will be for anyone who stores up treasure for himself but is not rich to God. Do not worry. Consider the ravens. Consider the lilies. They, the ravens get fed. The li lilies are beautiful in their season. Are you glorifying and beautiful, beautifulizing this world? I don't know if that's a word or not. For God's glory so that they'll see Christ Jesus in you. Are you doing that? Your heavenly Father knows what you need. He will give it to you. Jesus already said that when he talked about the prayer. Verse 31, But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father is pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide yourselves with purses that will not wear out an inexhaustible treasure in heaven. Are we working for that instead of the things of this world? Where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So now we're into the scripture that we're going to cover today. We're in Luke chapter 12, verse 35. And the King James, or this is the Bering Study Bible, says, Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning. That word is girded again. Keep your loins girded. Peter said to gird your loins of your mind so that you think differently because the people were suffering and they thought that Jesus didn't care, that Jesus was not coming back, whatever the th rumors were at the time or the false doctrines in this world. And here Jesus himself is telling you to be dressed, to hike up that skirt, to tie it around for what purpose? Either to go to battle or to go to work. That's the whole purpose in girding up your loins. That's why I showed you that photo so you would know it. It means you change the attire that you're normally wearing. You stand out differently. The rest of the world sees you differently because you're not dressed the same. You're not doing the same. You're prepared for battle for the Lord and His army. You're prepared to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you do that every single minute of every day. Let's read on. Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning. Then you will be like servants waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can open the door for him at once. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds on watch when he returns. Truly I tell you, he will dress himself to serve and will, make, and will have them recline at the table and he himself will come and wait on them. Did you catch that? Jesus is telling them to be servants. Servants are slaves. He's telling them to be ready no matter what time of night it is. To stay dressed, not to sleep. To have enough oil for their lamps. You can go to different scripture to see, to see that. To be ready and serving so that when He opens up the door, they will greet Him immediately and say, What can we do for you, Master? And those servants who do that, Jesus will say, Let me show you what I'm going to do for you. Did you catch that? I mean, Paul said we cannot fathom the richness and the goodness that God has for us for all eternity in heaven as His child. And the opposite of that is a place where there is no appearance, no factor of God in it whatsoever for all eternity. No goodness, no mercy, no grace, no nothing. Truly I tell you, he will dress himself to serve and he will have them recline at the table and he himself will come and wait on them. Even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night and finds them alert, those servants will be blessed. It says it again no matter what time of hour that is. But understand this, Jesus is clear in his teachings again. If the homeowner had known at what hour the thief was coming, this is a different example, don't get it confused. Now we're not compared to a servant, we're compared to a homeowner. One who owns a home in the kingdom of heaven. However you want to look at that. If he'd known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not let his house be broken into. If he was ready serving, if the servant was, he would have never had to worry about Jesus coming unannounced, the master coming unannounced. If the homeowner knew what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour you do not expect. I don't know if this is a true story or not. I heard it in a sermon. It talked about how crafty the devil is. I don't want to say too much or I'll give it away. But there's this guy that stole his family's car. 
and they put out a bulletin and you know, for peace and everything. A few days later, the car showed back up with a note. It said, I'm so sorry I got convicted for stealing your car. I apologize. Here's some money for the use and here's some tickets to this concert. Wow. So they took the money, they took the tickets to the concert, and they went. And they come back to find out their house had been broken into. Because the thief knew exactly when they would leave it unguarded. Now the devil doesn't, is not omniscient and everything as God is, but he's seeking, walking around, seeking whom he may devour. If you are saved, he wants to destroy you from having a fulfilled life in Christ. He wants to keep you from preaching the gospel message. He wants you to be a servant who's got laxing and doesn't do what their master has told them. So let's read on. So the Lord said, Peter, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And the Lord answered, with an answer again, you've got to figure out for yourself, who then is the faithful and wise manager? There's the answer. Are you? Are you faithful and wise in all that God has given you? Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their portion at the proper time? Blessed, we see that word again, is that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. Jesus talks again and again and again about rewards in heaven, rewarding, judging you for what you've done and rewarding you for what you've done. But he also says that there will come a time when you judge and you will have to stand accountable even if you're saved. And you might get in, as Paul says by Scripture again, <laughs> escaping through the flames. Verse 45, but suppose that servant says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming. And he begins to beat the manservants and maidservants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day he does not expect and an hour he does not anticipate. Then he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with unbelievers. It's one of the harshest verses in Scripture. Wait a minute. I thought I was a servant. I thought I was serving you. What about those times when, I'm, when I've fallen asleep and not paid attention and everything? Where do I need to be yet in my life? You need to be living as though today was the day that Jesus would return. Because if you thought that again, you would probably live a little differently than if you thought He was coming next year or in 10 years or 15 years. And it'd be so easily, easy to get caught up in the things that Jesus has already warned us about getting caught up in that the world gets caught up in. Not that there's anything wrong with, with children and family and riches and everything else, but are you using them for God's glory? And are you putting Him on the back burner for them because you think He's not coming right away? That servant who knows his master's will but does not get ready or follow his instructions will be beaten with many blows. But the one who unknowingly does things worthy of punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And from him who has been entrusted with much, even more will be demanded. You are rich if you're sitting here today. You have heard the gospel message without persecution in your life. You have a home over your head. You have money in your bank account, whether you have a high credit card debt or what. You live in a country that's free, regardless of what the outcome of the election will be. You are rich. Go back to that parable of the rich fool. Are you going to live your life for yourself? Or are you going to live your life to be rich for God? Verse 49, we're not going to get it to it today, but I want to read it because it's the next words of Jesus. I have come to ignite a fire on earth. He didn't come to, come to preach peace. If you live a life that brings glory and honor to God, you will suffer some for it. You'll be divided, as Jesus goes on to say, even in your own family. Because the more you become a Jesus freak, if that's how you want to say it, or sold out for the gospel or whatever, the more that your friends and family will even say, whoa, slow down a little bit. You're getting a little too far there, guy. But are you not doing what Jesus said and are you not dressed ready for service with that robe tied all up around you so that you can serve and your lamps trimmed and burning with enough oil that you won't run out, ready and waiting for Jesus to return to say, well done, my good and faithful servant, and hand out the rewards. 
So I hope, I don't know that you will or won't or what will become, but I hope that you continue through Luke's gospel, and I told you before I plan on continuing to try to do that too. I'm going to read you a sermon. Any one of you could do this, the elders especially. You could do your own, just like I just did, with no notes in front of me, with just Scripture. Or you could just read this and follow through. One of the first things we did when I became pastor here is we studied the book of Acts. <laughs> Irony in that, isn't there? Luke's other gospel message about how we live. And I remember that most everyone took part into that. It was on a Sunday night. You took time out of your schedule and everything else. And I remember Barry even continued after this, it was over and continued to visit Loyal because of the friendship and everything that he developed out of that. Living like Christ in this world. So my prayer, my prayer has been that, that you will continue on because if I leave here and, and you have not grown in Christ, then I really haven't done my job, have I? If you've grown in Christ, you can say, yeah, I can take a sermon. I can do it this week. I can study and do whatever it takes. Because you don't know how long it'll be till God brings in the shepherd that he brings. And we'll talk about that, that some in, in the business meeting. But there's no reason that you are not studying and living for Christ and presenting the gospel message. If you can't do it in here, are you going to do it in your workplace? Are you going to do it at home? So I'm going to do this just as an example. This is how do these books right here that I've bought for the church, and it's entitled Be Ready. It covers Luke chapter 12, verse 35 to 48. And I'm just going to read it. Arnold T. Olson wrote, Ever since the first days of the Christian church, evangelicals have been looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. They may have disagreed as to its timing and to the events on the eschatological eschatological, I'll get it out of my mouth, calendar. They may have differed as to pre-tribulation or post-tribulation rapture, the pre or post or non-millennium kingdom. They may have been divided as to literal rebirth of Israel. However, all are agreed that the final solution to the problem of this world is in the hands of the King of Kings, who will someday make the kingdoms of this world be his very own. Last two hymns we sang spoke of that. This agreement regarding the sure return of Jesus Christ to judge the living and the dead comes from the overwhelming evidence of Scripture. There are 260 chapters in the New Testament, and Christ's return is mentioned no less than 318 times in those chapters. Statistically, one verse in 25 mentions the Lord's return. The only book that doesn't mention the second advent are Galatians, which focuses on refuting the Judaizers, and the tiny letters of 2nd and 3rd John. Jesus himself spoke often of his return. He followed up his challenge to take up his cross and follow him by warning, If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. Mark 8, 38. Later in the Olivet Discourse, he announced, All that At that time men will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Mark 13, 26 and 27. In the upper room on the eve of his death, he promised, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. John 14, 3. Paul's letters abound with references to Jesus' return. For example, he encouraged the Philippians by saying, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. He later, later told the Thessalonians, for the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, he, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. That's 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-18. St. John begins the book of Revelation with the warnings, Look, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him. And all the people of the earth will mourn because of Him. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty, Revelation 1, 7 and 8. 
The scriptures about uh, scriptures shout that Christ is coming again. Peter called this a living hope. That's where Mark started his reading this morning, 1 Peter 1, verse 3. And Paul ter termed it the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, Titus 2, 13. How perfectly sweet this is. At this point in the Gospel of Luke, we find the first extended teaching on the second coming as Jesus warned His followers to be ready. The positioning of this warning in the flow of Luke's contents is very natural and revealing by recounting the parable of the rich fool. Jesus warned against material greed. He followed this with exalted warning not to worry over material things. And now Christ challenges hearers to be ready for His return. Jesus saw readiness for His return as the antidote to greed and worry. So how should we be ready? Verses 35 to 40. The first way is like a faithful servant. Jesus recommended a manner of readiness like that of a faithful, devoted servant. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. Verses 35 and 36. A Hebrew wedding celebration could last several days so that the time of the master's return could be anyone's guess. But the uncertainty did not put off these excellent servants. Though it was late at night, they were dressed, ready for service. That is, that is, they not only remained fully clothed in daytime wear, but they had their waist girded, with their long robes tucked under their belts, making it impossible for them, making it possible for them to move quickly to the door. They were ready and prepared. The night was also kept bright because they diligently replenished the oil in their lamps and trimmed the wicks for maximum light. They were alert, they were awake and alert. These servants were remarkable. They did not give in to fatigue. They displayed no irritability or grouchiness. They did not have an attitude. Rather, they kept a bright house and bare legs so they could spring up to give their master a joyful reception. That is how Jesus' followers are to wait for him. It's not to be passive or lethargic, but one filled with active service, continual preparation, and joyous anticipation. What a lovely scene greeted the returning master. Warm light streamed from the windows, breathless smiling, eager servants bearing shining lamps gathered at the door, and no doubt there were choice nocturnal snacks on the table. My image comes to peanut butter cookies and milk. Welcome home, master. We're all so glad you're back. Here, give us your robe. Sit down. Let us wash your feet. You must be so tired. This was lovely indeed, but even better was what happened to the servants. Jesus went on to say, It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve. He will call them to recline at the table and have them come and wait on them. Verse 37. The master was so moved by their faithfulness that instead of sitting down at the table, he dressed himself to wait on them. The same Greek word used here is the same used for dressed ready for service for, service for the servants. He made them recline about around the table and serve them. What joy is portrayed in this night's feast. The girded, bare-legged master setting dishes before his servants, refilling their cups. Happy, even uproarious conversation floated from the well-lit house. Several months later in the upper room in Jerusalem, when the Lord stripped himself and wrapped a towel about his waist and washed his feet, the, the feet of the twelve, John 13, verses 1 through 17, they were witnesses to an action that was both symbolic of His work in the Incarnation and prophetic of the Messianic meal at the inauguration of the Kingdom, the Wedding Supper of the Lamb. At the meal, people will come from east and west, north and south, and will take their place at the feast in the Kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are, la who are last who will be first, and who are the first who will be last, Luke 13, 29. The future celebration is described in Revelation in unstinted terms. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given for her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. 
Revelation 9, 19, verses 6 through 9. That passage helps us understand Jesus' words in verse 38 of Luke chapter 12. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night, verse 38. It will be good literally reads, blessed are those servants. Those who have been had to wait until the second watch, which is 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., or the third watch, which is 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., the world's very last time period before the words, the return of Christ, are nevertheless blessed. We will, be, we will be blessed if we are ready, that is, serving and ready to serve, dressed for action, the lights on. Why? Because we are going to sit down at the Feast of Feasts as guests of the King of Kings. Eternity is no sterile, plastic, nickel-plated existence. It is a sumptuous feast. It is laughter, it is jubilation, it is intimate fellowship, and it is eternal. Those who are ready for Christ's return are not lolling around lethargically nor sitting on the church steps dressed in white robes. They are alive and active serving Christ. Are you ready? Now we went through how to be ready like a faithful servant was the first one. The second one is like a wise homeowner. The other analogy Jesus employed to urge readiness for his return was to be a wise homeowner. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Verse 39 and 40. Among all the sayings, Jesus, there, uh, sayings of Jesus, there are none that are more clearly evidenced in the writings of the apostle, apostles. Paul wrote, for you know very well that that day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly. As labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. How many women do you know that ever have labor pains and did not give birth? Whether the child was alive and healthy or not, when the labor pains come, you do not stop them. Birth happens. Jesus will return. <clears throat> Peter used similar words. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear like with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. 2 Peter 3.10 The risen Lord Himself said, Remember therefore what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I'll come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Revelation 3.3 3. And behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and shamefully exposed. Revelation 16.15 The celebrated Scottish preacher of the last century, Robert Murray McCheen, of Dundee, who exercised so much influ influence during his brief 29 years, used to ask groups of pastors the question, Do you think the Lord is coming tonight? The preachers would quietly respond, No. Then he would counter with a quote from our text, The Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. It was a trick question and a bit unfair, because to say that this day out of three quarters of a million since the resurrection is the day is quite bold. On the other hand, we'd live 750,000 days closer to the return. And indeed, Christ's return will always be on a statistically improbable day when the world does not expect it. But His waiting servants with their lamps burning, dressed with their loins girded, wow, they'll be blessed. There is a sense in which humbly saying, I don't think he will come back tonight, increases the likelihood that it will be tonight. Though, of course, no one knows when he'll return. The point is, Jesus' return will be unexpected like a thief in the night, and the world will not be prepared. The networks will not be prepared. The world's leaders will not be prepared. The false religions will not be prepared. And most of the church will not be prepared. But there are a faithful few who will be ready they will see the signs of the times. They will be ready because they have obeyed the Word of God and they will be blessed. They will be ready because their sleeves are rolled up and their lights are on as they labor for Christ. Jesus could come today. Perhaps He will. 
Next thing Jesus talks about is the consequences of one state of readiness. It's verses 41 to 48. This was electrifying teaching, and the disciples' minds were reeling at the implication. So Peter asked the question that they were all thinking, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? Verse 41. Jesus' subsequent answer revealed that the parable was for the twelve and then for others who would subsequently let Jesus uh, uh, exercise authority over their life. Reward for wise and faithful servants. The Lord said reward would be given to the ready, the wise and the faithful. Verse 42 to 44. Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he'll put him in charge of all his possessions. In simplest English, the servant of Christ who has been faithful in his temporary earthly responsibility will at Christ's return be given vast permanent authority in an eternal state. This principle is again highlighted in the parable of the ten minas, which I gave you a little bit of earlier, Luke 19, verses 15 to 17. Then he sent for his servants to whom... He had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant. His master replied, Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. As to the nature of the enlarged eternal authority, we do not know. But we can be sure it will be joyous, because to do his bidding will be the delectable food and drink of the redeemed. I am reminded of the earthly servant John brought us, the faithful president of Southern Baptist Seminary during the Civil War. At the war's end, the seminary had four professors and seven students, and one of those was blind. That's all they had. Only the blind student took his course on preaching. Under such circumstances, many preachers would have tempted to give less than their best. But not Dr. DeBrodus, who gave painstaking care to every lecture. Those magnificent lectures became the substance for the most famous and influential books of all homiletics in the in American history, the preparation and delivery of sermons. Broadus authority was increased because he was a faithful servant, but that is only the beginning of the story. The final story is being written now as Broadus serves Christ in his eternal state. There's also punishment for the foolish and unfaithful servants. Of course, not all servants are faithful and wise, so Jesus addressed their plight as well. And notice this this punishment is not for those who aren't servants. This punishment is for those who are servants. But suppose the servants say to himself, My master is taking a long time in coming. He then begin to beat the men servants and women servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. In an hour he is not aware, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers, verse 45 and 46. The servant here has not simply been lazy or indulgent, but monstrously unfaithful, a drunken glutton who beats not only men and women, an abuser of both divine trust and human life. His life is is grotesque perversion. When the master Jesus returns, the cruel servant suffers a grisly end and Christ pronounces him to be an unbeliever. Those in Christian leadership may profess what they will. They can use every Christian cliche, hold the Bible like Billy Graham, say the Bible says, build a following in wide Christian circles. But if that man or woman consistently behaves in an unchristian way, he or she is not a true believer. Paul tells the Ephesians, For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater. He has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them. Ephesians 5, verses 5 through 7. And listen to St. John. This is how we know who are the children of God and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. 1 John 3.10 Everything will be revealed when Jesus returns, so we must make sure our life matches our profession. Everything will be put right and the truth will be known at last. There will be justice on earth. There is a just punishment awaiting. Jesus tells us that ultimate justice will be 
exquisitely meted out. The servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. Verse 47 and 48. Some people by virtue of their great knowledge, age, experience, and influence in the church will suffer far great penalty for the same sin than an ignorant person will. James rightly warned, not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brother, because you know that he who teaches will be judged more strictly. James 3, 1. Equity at the end of this unfair world is a delectable thought. Praise God that he is such a judge that nothing will get by him. Praise him for his fairness and, of course, praise him for his grace, our only hope. A just proverb to consider. Jesus summed it all up in a famous proverb. From everyone who has been given, much more will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted, with much more will be asked. You know, that's Spider-Man's motto to somewhat... What if Spider-Man didn't live like Spider-Man? I guess that'd be Venom instead if you know anything about comics. But Spider-Man went out and did good. He fought against evil. And you're called to gird up your loins and fight against the evil of this world to live like Christ until your master returns. Think carefully how you live. For everyone who has been given, much more will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. We have so much. We have the word of the Old Testament, the word of the prophets, the word of the covenants. We have the word of the New Testament, the revelation of the incarnation, the gospel of grace, the life and teaching of, di of Jesus, the apostol apostolic witnesses and teaching. We have 2,000 years of church testimony. We have abundant preaching. We have Christian education. We have thousands of books. We have a wealth of opportunity. Consequently, much is required of us. Closing reflections. The thrust of Jesus' message can be summed up in two words. Get ready. His return is as sure as His incarnation. The second advent of Christ is as sure as the first advent. He will come when least expected. CNN will not expect it. Wall Street will have no hint. The nations will have no clue. The world's religions disbelieve it. To these He is coming like a thief in the night. Revelation closes with Jesus' promise. Yes, I am coming soon. And we say with the people of God, Amen. Come Lord Jesus, come. How can we be ready? By living a godly life that reflects the abundant truth God has given us. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2, 11 and 13. By joyful service, be ready, dressed for ready service, keeping your lamps burning like men and women waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. Luke 12, 35 and 36. Roll up your sleeves, gird your loins, turn the lights on, trim the wicks, have the oil burning. Jesus is coming soon. Now you might say, that's the best sermon you ever gave, Ellen. If it is, good, I'm fine with that. But you could have done the same thing. You can do, this, do the same thing. I hope you will continue through, Luke. I'm not leaving yet. I'll be here in November. We don't know what the future holds, but we know that we are the church. We know that we're called by God, saved by His grace, to be a light in Bonner's Ferry. We are springs of living water. Are we living like that? And it doesn't matter if I'm here, it doesn't matter if you're here. If there's two or three gathered together, we're the body of Jesus Christ. Are we dressed and ready for service in this godless world? Are we the light that we've called, God has called us to be? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are a mighty God, worthy of all glory and honor and praise. We thank you that Jesus gave up heaven and did not consider equality with God as something to be gained, but in low, humbly lowered himself, 
that he went before his accusers without saying anything to justify himself, without calling a legion of angels down to take him off that cross. But instead he suffered and he gave up his spirit and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. And he said, it is finished. We know because of that that death has no sting for us. Help us to be like Christ in this world, to be true believers, to walk by faith, not by sight, that condemn this world and live as righteous because that is what you've called us to be, children of light. We thank you and praise you for the, the goodness and grace that you give us every single day. We May we use it for your glory and honor, and may your words not be found void in our lives, but to be lived out by the Holy Spirit and the word of truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.